Composer, conductor, pianist, educator, opinionated, bold, effervescent, energetic. All of these are words one can use in description of him. Today, we're going on a little bit of a musical road trip to see some of the sights and sounds of his childhood, and of course, talk about his life story and what made him tick along the way. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein was born Louis Bernstein in August 1918, although he was called Leonard from birth and would legally change it when he was 16. He loved music as a toddler, but as a kid, his childhood home didn't actually have a piano at first. He enjoyed the piano at friends' houses, and he was such a clearly smart cookie that he had such an immense vocabulary that by the time he was about one and a half, they started calling him the little old man. He was also a sickly kid prone to asthma, and he had a dust allergy that he inherited from his father. Another sickly character in the family was their Aunt Clara. They called her Crazy Clara, and she was, among other things, a sun-worshipping nudist. She had followed her brother, Leonard's father, to the United States in 1911, and she gave Leonard an upright piano. This piano was electrifying for Leonard, who would soon outgrow his childhood sicknesses. Within a year, he learned to read music, and he loved learning how harmony and form worked so he could pick out his favorite songs. This is the site of the William Lloyd Garrison Grammar School. Uh, this has since been converted into residencies, um, but this was Bernstein's elementary school, and uh, it's less than half a mile from his home synagogue, and sources have him graduating here either 1929 or 1930, um, but he started at his high school in 1929, so he's graduated here in 1929. It's pretty cool. It's on the Register of Historic Places now. There's the sign. On the corner of Elm Hill Avenue and Seaver Street stands now the United House of Prayer, but this is the original location of Temple Mishkan Tefila, which was the Bernstein's home synagogue. And it was the first synagogue in this part of the country associated with conservative Judaism. Leonard Bernstein had his bar mitzvah here in 1932. This place was integral to Bernstein's musical upbringing, especially due to the influence of their organist, a fellow named Solomon Baslavsky. He arrived two years before the Bernsteins did, and his music making, Leonard Bernstein said of this, I shall probably never be able to estimate the real influence those sounds exerted on me. And the congregation has since moved to a new location on Harvard Street in Brookline. His first teacher, Frida Karp, told his mother that she couldn't keep up when Leonard started to sight-read stuff that she could barely even play, so he wanted to study instead with Susan Williams of the New England Conservatory, who charged $45 per lesson in today's money. It was just $3 back then. That was a considerable amount of money, and Sam, his father, didn't want to pay that. He had a warped idea of what musicians were in the United States. He thought of klezmer musicians back in the old country, and he envisioned that his son was telling him that he wanted to basically grow up to be little more than a beggar. He just didn't know that there were so many more musical opportunities in the United States. It really wasn't a matter of affording it because Sam was one of the few businessmen who were basically unaffected by the economic impact of the Great Depression. In 1932, the Bernstein family moved here to a home in Newton, Massachusetts that they had built. Sam Bernstein was very picky about where they lived and their living conditions, and it was a sign of their upward mobility that during the Depression, they not only built and maintained this house, but also a summer house down in Sharon, Massachusetts, about 16 miles south. They also permanently moved down to Sharon in 1941. A duo of whoever lives here now understands the historical significance of the house that Sam built. Leonard was a savvy kid, and so he would offer piano lessons to even younger kids at one dollar a piece, and he would team up with friends to play at weddings. This funded his lessons with Williams, who had, let's just say, unorthodox ideas on piano technique. It wasn't until May 1932 that Sam and his son would bond over music, when they went to a Boston Pops concert and Sam fell in love with Maurice Ravel's Bolero. 
Sam was now proud of his son's gift, as he now realized that there was more to music in America than he thought. By 15, Leonard was rounding up kids that he knew and doing amateur opera productions in very limited forms because they didn't have a whole lot of people involved. These included Leonard himself as a 15-year-old getting all decked out in a red dress and singing the title role of Carmen. This is Symphony Hall, the home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra since October 1900, and in 1933, Leonard Bernstein bought his first subscription here. In the fall, he was studying with a new piano teacher, Helen Coates, who fully appreciated his talents and noted how fast of a learner he was. She would go on to serve as his secretary until her death in 1989. This won his father over, and his mother would rebuke neighbors who complained about the noise, saying that they would one day pay to hear him. Sandwiched between the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Medical Center area here in Boston is the Boston Latin School, the oldest public school in the United States, founded in April 1635. That's a year older than Harvard. Bernstein started here in 1929, and soon enough he was accepted into Harvard itself. At Harvard, Bernstein was initially without a whole lot of direction. He continued to study the piano, but he was not at concert pianist level. And there's only one surviving composition from this era, which is a psalm setting. Like Elliot Carter had found, the culture at Harvard wasn't a whole lot to write home about, and for the first time, Bernstein had to face anti-Semitism. But he remained an optimist, and he focused on the positives, telling a friend that he intended to cultivate a Harvard accent. A meeting with conductor Dmitri Metropolis stoked his passion for going far in composition. Although the enthusiastic conductor would later also encourage Bernstein's talent on the podium. For Bernstein, the conductor had, growing up watching the Boston Symphony, been this faraway figure, and he never really had aspirations to be in that role, but others saw his charisma and his talent and his ability to lead others and knew that he would be a great fit for that role. As a pianist, his career continued to progress, not to mention his abilities. He learned Aaron Copland's piano variations, and he was proud that he could clear a room by playing them. When he finally met Copland, he soon thereafter got this opportunity to play that piece at his birthday party at Copland's New York Loft. And this was a party that no one left when he started to play the variations. Copland would soon become a trusted friend and mentor to Bernstein. It also meant that as he grew his network, he became more and more distant from his formal studies at Harvard, which he soon described as a, quote, great waste. Bernstein had reached out to Copeland inquiring about studying conducting at Juilliard, but the deadline had already passed, and so he decided to go to the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia instead. It was a sudden decision, and in order to get in, he had to pass an exam given by Fritz Reiner, who taught conducting there. Bernstein had to play Brahms' academic festival overture at the piano, at sight, and identify it as part of the getting in process. While Curtis was tuition free, he still paid for living expenses, which is where Metropolis came in, because Sam did not want to continue to fund his son's education. The Greek born conductor was interested in developing Bernstein as his protege in Minneapolis, but this fell through for a couple of reasons. The orchestra itself was not super thrilled with the idea of Metropolis hiring someone from out of state, while the actual management of the ensemble caught wind that Bernstein was still a student, so they told Metropolis that they couldn't hire him. Bernstein did get a chance to conduct in Tanglewood, out in the Berkshires, a relatively new festival, under the auspices of Serge Kusevitsky, who had a grand vision and even grander promises. Kusevitsky had promised to produce five genius conductors in five years. The elder Russian encouraged Bernstein to use a baton, something that Metropolis didn't do, and he also wanted Bernstein to change his name to Leonard S. Burns as an Americanism. Other conductors followed through on this, especially if they had Jewish names, and Kusevitsky was convinced that Bernstein would go further if he didn't have an overtly Jewish name. He learned much at Tanglewood in 1940, but his future at Curtis was then in doubt. Reiner threatened to expel him because he feared that Kusevitsky would poach him. This was pretty much an empty threat because Curtis wanted their most talented student back, but Kusevitsky and Reiner exchanged sharp words over telegram. This was all happening sort of in the background, and Bernstein was actually concerned about the newly instated draft. 
Kuzovitsky trying to get him a position in the USO to try to get him out of the firing line of active service, but Bernstein was called before his draft board anyway and was classified 4F because he had asthma. His mentors pushed him towards conducting. Even Copeland, who was much more composer than he was conductor. Nevertheless, 1942 saw Bernstein's first symphony as well as a humorous song cycle called I Hate Music. Copeland's response revealed his true attitude towards Bernstein's compositions. He wanted Bernstein, if he were going to be a composer, to write something that was entirely his own, not cribbed off of someone else stylistically. Copeland told Bernstein that work was not guaranteed in New York, but on his 25th birthday, Bernstein was offered the post of assistant conductor of the New York Philharmonic. This was a fait accompli for about four months as principal conductor Artur Rodzinski's other candidates were either not American or were serving in the armed forces. Soon, Bernstein was given the opportunity to show off. Rodzinski invited Bruno Walter to guest conduct, and Rodzinski was recuperating in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. But Bruno Walter fell ill, leaving Bernstein to debut with a Philharmonic on a tricky radio-broadcasted concert. It had been decades since the Philharmonic had had to call upon their assistant conductor to fill in at an afternoon concert, and despite all the nerves and all the pressure, Bernstein succeeded. It was an incredible triumph. Kusevitsky phoned in his congratulations while Rajinsky was able to plow through the Stockbridge snow and make the four-hour drive to New York City just in time to catch the very tail end of the concert. Bernstein was buried in interview requests overnight, and it's no wonder that a fellow student said that Bernstein was doomed to success. What helped his instant fame was that at that point, there weren't any famous American-born conductors, and his youth definitely helped with that as well. When Metropolis had started his American career, he was in his 40s, and he was considered young. Bernstein, at a little more than half that age, and talented, and American, this was something that the American musical culture was not used to. The Mercurial Rajinsky was upset when he fell ill and Bernstein could not take over for him, but Bernstein had a good alibi because he was away having his first symphony, subtitled Jeremiah and dedicated to his father, premiered in Pittsburgh, and Rajinsky, who was unfortunately prone to acts of domestic abuse, was physically violent towards his assistant after he missed a rehearsal. Bernstein no longer needed Rajinsky and he toured his Jeremiah Symphony around the world. And its powerful message was made even more powerful as news of the Holocaust became more and more widespread. It's really hard to overstate how sudden Bernstein's rise to fame was, but let's put it this way. His first musical, On the Town, was the first musical whose film rights were purchased before the show was even produced. He loved the holistic artistry and the collaborations of Broadway. But Kusevitsky turned up and basically put the fear of God into him, saying that he shouldn't be wasting his time on non-conducting pursuits, even other musical pursuits. Kusevitsky wanted him to be a classical conductor and nothing else. Kusevitsky did line up Bernstein's next job with the New York City Symphony Orchestra, a shoestring outfit only nominally supported by the city. With the end of World War II, thousands of young, talented musicians were pouring back into the city, and the ad hoc nature of the orchestra meant that it was up to Bernstein to find new, good players. He auditioned over 300 youngsters, and even though the pay was bad, like, Bernstein didn't even get a salary, the orchestra was good. And this made the New York Philharmonic down the street 
kind of upset. A good city symphony made for a cheap rival to their very well-crafted product. Kusevitsky still held a lot of sway over Bernstein, and when Bernstein wrote his ballet facsimile, he was going to premiere a concert version with the Boston Symphony when he guest conducted it. And Kusevitsky wrote him really kind of a harsh letter smacking that down. At this point, the three biggest musical names in his life were Copland, Kusevitsky, and Metropolis, and all three of them encouraged him to become a conductor, not a composer. When Copland listed the best of American music in a March 1948 article, he did so with the reservation that Bernstein wrote what he liked to call conductor's music. When the opportunity came for Bernstein to perhaps star in a film, the first thing that Copland said was, well, have you considered how much this is going to affect your conducting career? The busyness of this career was one of the reasons that Bernstein waited for five years between his initial engagement to Felicia Montalegre and marrying her. Felicia was an actress by training and a pianist who had met Bernstein in 1946. They were only officially a couple a month before their engagement, leading some to speculate that Bernstein really wanted to be married. Being married was a sign of maturity that might help land him his next steady conducting job, and it would help dispel rumors that he was gay, as that might have been a factor in who the Boston Symphony would select as Kusevitsky's successor. The question of Bernstein's sexuality is one that largely depends on what source you trust. Felicia, for her part, thought that her husband, or eventual husband, we haven't gotten to that yet, was gay whereas others considered him bisexual, or even, I've seen the term, omnisexual. Those who say that he was bisexual usually like to make a distinction between his attraction to women and his attraction to men, saying that he was attracted to women emotionally, but attracted to men physically. Bernstein was really truly devoted to her, and there's no evidence to suggest that he didn't love her. He tested the waters, as he said, by, before they got married, imagining him with a guy and then imagining himself with Felicia. And imagining himself with Felicia canceled out his gay crushes, so he thought, aha, this is the woman for me. As we'll see, this didn't totally turn out. We're gonna get there, don't worry. As a teenager, Bernstein often mused on the nature of his feelings, and what came out in his writings was a desire for deep, close friendships. As he matured before his marriage, he would often tell family and friends of his desire to get married and have a family. The couple would end up canceling their initial engagement when Felicia got a sense of who her fiancé was in his element and the busyness of his lifestyle. Bernstein really missed her when she moved on to a different man, Dick Hart, because Bernstein just felt that he was totally wrong for her. There were concerns about his potential future in Boston as he had traveled to Palestine in 1947, which he enjoyed immensely. Despite all the turmoil in the waning years of the British protectorate, the connection that Bernstein had to his Jewish heritage was unsurpassed. Even though the orchestra was of somewhat middling quality, he made them play like their pants were on fire. He could speak Hebrew to them in rehearsal, and that was not something he could get anywhere in the United States. They offered him the permanent position of music director that summer, but he had to decline. Basically, he wanted that Boston Symphony job, and there was no way back then that they would have let him have two simultaneous music directorships on two different continents. Nowadays, this is a little bit more common, as with the current music director of the Boston Symphony, but, you know... It, Transatlantic Traveler really was a beast back then, so I really don't blame him. Of course, Bernstein claimed to not want the Boston Symphony job, but it's not like any conductor would turn down that post if it were offered to him. He gave up the city symphony after three seasons because he hassled with the city, and they simply wouldn't give him the funds that he felt the orchestra needed. In April 1948, the almost unthinkable happened, and Charles Musch was announced as Kusevitsky's successor. It seems likely that Bernstein quit the City Symphony in anticipation of taking over in Boston, but now he was free, so he took the job in Tel Aviv as the director of the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra. Additionally, Bernstein served as a cultural bridge builder in blasted-out post-war Germany, where hunger was rampant 
and wages were often paid in cigarettes instead of money. In Munich, he had the opportunity to conduct an orchestra assembled from survivors of the Dachau concentration camp. Italy and France were also enthralled with the young American, but Vienna not so much. Bernstein had bristled when he had gotten the opportunity to potentially conduct the Vienna Philharmonic in a concert, citing the fact that the Vienna Philharmonic was still majority Nazi. When he conducted their rival, the Vienna Symphony, the players were openly hostile to him. It took until the mid-60s before Bernstein would actually have any success in Vienna when he conducted opera and Mahler. The Palestine Orchestra was now the Israel Philharmonic, and tensions were high as violence racked the newly declared State of Israel. Bernstein was openly unafraid, playing during air raid warnings and when artillery shells were still audible. When Israeli forces captured Beersheba in 1948, Bernstein assembled an orchestra of 35 musicians and went down into the desert in order to play a concert for the troops. When Egyptian reconnaissance planes saw this mass of troops assembled in the desert, they rerouted some of the forces that they had massed near Jerusalem in order to counter this force, fearing that this was where the next assault would be. They didn't know that there would be another reason that so many troops would be gathered in one place, and it was to hear Mozart, Beethoven, and Gershwin. By 1949, he wanted to stop conducting and focus just on writing music that year, and while the project that became West Side Story has its inception then, he did not stop conducting. Like every composer-conductor, Bernstein was caught between two professions that required intense time commitments. Gustav Mahler at least had the summers off, but that was a different era. With summer engagements and festivals and all sorts of other things to keep him busy during the quote-unquote off-season, he could not do the Mahler thing. For one thing, Bernstein was just too much of a social animal, and when he did clear his schedule in order to compose, as often as not, he'd just catch up on much-needed rest instead. In January 1951, Felicia's then-boyfriend Dick Hart died suddenly of a heart problem, and the timing of this rekindled her and Bernstein's romance. 1951 also saw the premiere of Charles Ives' Second Symphony, a performance that the frail Ives was thrilled to hear on the radio. Despite successes, Bernstein wanted to give it up for at least two years to focus on composition. He couldn't. For one, Kusevitsky was old and frail and worried that he wouldn't be able to run Tanglewood that summer. And in June, when Bernstein was off in Mexico writing his opera Trouble in Tahiti, news of Kusevitsky's imminent death came to him, and he rushed back to the United States in time to be at his mentor's side when he passed. It fell on Bernstein to take over the Tanglewood Festival after Kusevitsky's death. He was the heir apparent in that regard. And this was fortuitous in the sense that this allowed him and Felicia to reconnect. They got engaged again and married in September 1951. A few months later, Felicia was pregnant, and the combination of raising a family and being married to Bernstein almost killed her acting career. She only took television work from then on if her husband was also in town for the sake of the kids, and stated later that his career was far more important than hers. In June 1952, Bernstein was invited here to the campus of Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts, to direct a festival of creative arts which is still ongoing at the end of every semester, and now bears his name. Trouble in Tahiti was premiered here. The train tracks you see here, which are now part of the MBTA commuter rail system, caused a racket during the performance. The festival was ambitious and helped put the recently founded Brandeis on the map. Beyond the festival, Bernstein was also hired as a visiting professor, alongside Irving Fine, where Bernstein planned to spend one day a week teaching. He only spent two years directing this festival, quitting because he just had too much on his plate, although he was given an honorary doctorate in 1959 and stayed on as a fellow of the university until 1974. Conducting and composition were two full-time jobs, and if he just focused on one, he could have been a festival director, he could have been a composer, he could have been an academic. He would have been able to do things that weren't such huge time commitments. So the real question is, in addition to him just being a straight-up workaholic who can never say no, which is definitely true, why did he take on so many jobs? For one thing, he actually needed the money because his expenses kept up with his income. The International Lifestyle tore at Felicia. 
he knew that she was always in distress over wanting to go with him, but also needing to stay behind to care for their young child. But he just could not say no to a new project, which now included film scoring he was tasked with writing the music for the film On the Waterfront. Bernstein also had this insatiable appetite and would often raid the icebox or refrigerator, but later in life he would take to eating baby food in his study as a late night snack. In 1954, Bernstein's career as an educator rocketed off when he appeared on a television program called Omnibus, where he looked at dismissed sketches from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Later programs saw him explaining difficult pieces of the 20th century in terms that revealed his conservative tastes. Bernstein was many things, but a serial composer he was not. He was also, and we're going to get to his hiring here a little bit later, in charge of the Young People's Concert with the New York Philharmonic, which had dated back to the 1885-86 to season. And this was arguably the most significant thing that he did during his tenure with his orchestra. He hosted them even after his tenure as music director elapsed, and they were so popular that some parents would sign their kids up at birth in order to get on the waiting list. Opera conducting was now a thing, and he spent some time in Milan at La Scala, but he didn't really get along with the orchestra and the management there, and that was all fine and dandy from Felicia's perspective, because she was pregnant with their second child. Yet Bernstein was still at it, now collaborating with Stephen Sondheim, on West Side Story, which was now taking elements of its final form, but which had to be shelved for a bit for Candide, another musical. This high-minded Voltaire adaptation has suffered on stage because of its source material's resistance to adaptation, its subtle satire, and its lack of true star. Bernstein's music was never at fault. The pieces of this puzzle just never quite fit together. The experience of Candide did not make him eager to want to get back out there with the still halfway finished West Side story. Felicia wanted him to focus more on composing because that meant him being home more. But events transpired to get him back on the podium. He was selected as a co-director of the New York Philharmonic starting in 1957 alongside an aging metropolis. In the midst of making this deal official, West Side Story opened in Washington, D.C. to a room full of important politicians, and it proved to be the Broadway smash hit that Bernstein had long sought. From 1958 onwards, Bernstein would serve as the sole music director of the New York Philharmonic, as Metropolis had quit in order to focus more on conducting opera. Although Bernstein really loved and respected Metropolis, he understood that Metropolis had let the orchestra get less precise, so Bernstein, when he had full control, instituted structural reforms. He had total control over where the players sat. He made sure that they were super precise. He had control over how many concerts they did in a week and in a season. And overall, he just wanted to make the orchestra as good as it could possibly be. Like his old mentor Kusevitsky had done, Bernstein championed American music. Bernstein said that his lack of composition in this era was justified because he said that when he was on the podium conducting, it was as if he himself had composed the pieces that he was directing with his baton. As Soviet-American tensions arose in the late 1950s, Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic were sent on a mission of cultural diplomacy to the Soviet Union, bringing with them more avant-garde and modernist pieces, including Charles Ives' The Unanswered Question and Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Later, they went to Japan, a subtler spot for fighting the Cold War in culture. The festival that they played at was actually covertly funded by the CIA. I talk about this a little bit more in my Boulez video, but suffice to say that the CIA was interested in promoting avant-garde music because the Soviet musical culture in a deeply ironic way, was actually quite conservative. Bernstein was enamored with Japan and their culture. He once sliced open one of his fingers because he got so distracted by watching the sumo wrestling on TV. But the Japanese were less than enthusiastic about this festival. Sure, it had its fair share of supporters, but a lot of other Japanese were concerned about the Western-centric nature of this festival, which had been more or less foisted upon them, they felt. Bernstein would also come to disagree with other musicians, most famously the pianist Glenn Gould, an eccentric Canadian who insisted on taking the first movement of the Brahms D minor concerto at basically half tempo. Bernstein washed his hands of culpability in the pre-performance talk, while Gould 
would soon retire from public performances in lieu of studio recordings. Bernstein's own recording career had commenced in January 1950, and by the end of the decade, his recordings were so popular that Columbia Records did everything in their power to keep RCA from poaching him. RCA really, really wanted him, so Columbia came back and said, okay, we're going to give you a 20-year contract, which is just a mammoth contract for any artist. And on top of that, they were going to give Bernstein total creative control over what got recorded, which is just totally unheard of. You, record companies just don't do this. But they knew that Bernstein was such a cash cow that they would make a ton of money. Bernstein, the Philharmonic, would make a ton of money, and it would be just a good deal all around, so he signed it. Bernstein was also hard at work on his third and, as it turns out, final symphony, the Kaddish, which was posthumously dedicated to John F. Kennedy. In it, a narrator figure played by Felicia in the American premiere argues with God, a concept found in Jewish scriptures and literature. Bernstein was not a poet, and the words that he wrote for this piece lean towards the heavy-handed and hammy stuff. But keep in mind that this piece was written not initially as uh, an elegy for JFK, but at a time when it seemed like nuclear annihilation might be imminent. And he also wanted a very dramatic piece for his wife to perform in as a narrator figure. In addition to the dedication of the symphony to JFK, the Bernsteins were shocked to hear of the sudden death of their friend, the composer Mark Blitzstein's death, at the hands of three muggers in Martinique in early 1964. The Philharmonic season wasn't his best either. Bernstein disliked a lot of avant-garde music, which was sonically modern in the same way that Jackson Pollock was to visual art. Bernstein was not a fan of that either, once buying a painting done by a chimpanzee, displaying it in his living room, and goading his guest into asking who painted it. Yet perhaps in order to generate controversy, Bernstein intentionally programmed a lot of avant-garde pieces in the 1964 season. These were preceded by critically roasted talks. Alan Rich of the Herald Tribune, a music critic, said that between the lackluster performances and the condescending pre-performance talks, he wondered if Bernstein was actually trying to kill the avant-garde, but nevertheless even Rich had to admit that he was keeping the musical culture in New York interesting by programming such kind of ridiculous sounding to most ears pieces. His last real brush with serialism came in January 1969, when the composer Milton Babbitt had a piece called Relata II premiered. Even Babbitt, although having been commissioned by the Philharmonic Society to write it, thought that this premiere was a mistake. Since the Philharmonic audience didn't want to hear it, Babbitt noted, it would be like a high-minded philosopher appearing on a late-night talk show. Bernstein would say that pop music was more important than anything written in serious music of his day. He even took his kids backstage at the Ed Sullivan Show in order to meet the Beatles. For Bernstein, the advanced musical techniques of academics were stuffy, while pop music was full of invention and vitality. Bernstein started a sabbatical year that summer, which gave him 15 months off from Philharmonic duty, and although he planned a new theater piece, nothing came of this, and the only thing that he wrote of substance in this 15-month period was a choral piece called the Chichester Psalms. He wrote this after two months of intensely studying the avant-garde, he came to the conclusion that it simply just wasn't his music. He spent a lot of his time off not just on these little projects, but also in pondering the death of tonality and what direction music should take going forward. While never again making a habit of consistently programming avant-garde music per se, he did program a lot of works from the 20th century, which meant more Mahler. Bernstein's conducting has a great sense of drama and scale, and he often takes slower tempos than some other conductors, and I think this generally helps him more than it hurts him. He can wring all the emotion out of something, and you can hear a lot finer details in his recordings than maybe some others. Later on in his career, he would make a show of starting a piece and then not using his hands while conducting. Especially with a good orchestra, he would solely direct them using his eyes. Bernstein's love of Mahler had originated with Rajinsky, and he had conducted, in 1947, a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony when he was music director of the City Symphony. Bernstein was one of a handful of conductors who championed Mahler, and the Second Symphony's enormous breadth and customary Mahlerian detail was a perfect fit for Bernstein. In 1950, he conducted the orchestral song cycle Das Lied von der Erde in Israel, and noted to the New York Times 
They identified strongly with Mahler, feeling as though they had similar struggles. The 1959 to 1960 season was a Mahler retrospective, and his recordings of the final symphonies after he came back from his sabbatical were met with incredible acclaim. Yet with guest appearances in Vienna and London sapping his time and energy, Felicia noted how much he seemed to have aged. Leonard believed that his life was two-thirds over, and he informed the New York Philharmonic that he was not going to seek a contract extension past when his term expired in 1969. Right before the season ended, Bernstein's father Sam died. 1970 immediately saw controversy in January as Bernstein, a long advocate of social justice, held a fundraiser for the Black Panthers at his apartment. Tom Wolfe, in his article entitled Radical Chic, painted Bernstein and his socialite colleagues he invited to mingle with the Panther leadership as emblematic of socialites' obsession with supporting radical political causes, not because they believed in them, but because civil rights was fashionable. Today, people might call this behavior virtue signaling, with Bernstein and his associates champagne socialists who wanted to say they were on this certain side, but really, because of their place in society, they couldn't support them as much as they might seem like they wanted to. Felicia cited her stance as a civil libertarian, saying that the fundraiser was simply to get money in order to pay for the legal expenses for detained Panthers awaiting trial. She and others had legitimate civil liberty concerns. The $100,000 bail set on 10 of the Panthers was essentially preventative detention, and the fact that solitary confinement was being used was equivalent to torture. But this intimacy between high society and what many considered to be an outright terrorist organization raised a lot of eyebrows. Bear in mind that around this same time, Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver had gone to North Korea and was trying to promote the writings of Kim Il-sung in the United States. Like, that dude was a straight-up mass-murdering dictator, man. What are you doing? But in the long run, this didn't hurt him. It wasn't super out of character for Bernstein to be involved in the politics of the left. He had spoken out against the House Un-American Activities Committee. He and Albert Einstein had co-signed a letter encouraging the non-deportation of the composer Hans Eisler, and he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times citing systemic educational discrepancies as the reason that New York lacked trained black musicians in proportion to its population, which had gone down in the 1940s. Under McCarthyism, Bernstein realized that he couldn't renew his passport back in 1953, a potentially devastating blow for a conductor who relied on international conducting opportunities. It was only his connections at the State Department that let him get his passport renewed. In 1956, it was his friendship with then-Senator John F. Kennedy, who forged when they co-hosted an omnibus program about Harvard University that got him out of a potential appearance in front of a congressional committee. Bernstein's next big project was a mass, but not just any mass. Bernstein's mass is closer to musical than it is to anything else, although trying to pigeonhole it into a genre is almost impossible. It presents some of the same themes that he did in his Third Symphony, that of arguing with God, of having a central narrator figure question faith and end up coming back reconciled to it. Government officials were worried about its potentially subversive themes. Bernstein had visited, during the compositional process, Philip Berrigan, who had been arrested as part of a conspiracy to kidnap Henry Kissinger. Although eventually free due to a hung jury, Bernstein visited him while he was imprisoned. The FBI was keeping close eyes on Berrigan and his co-conspirators, and J. Edgar Hoover wrote to Attorney General John Mitchell that Bernstein might be planning something subversive in his mass, and he warned officials about going to the premiere for fear that they would accidentally clap at something they shouldn't. Oddly, Henry Kissinger was at the premiere. While Bernstein's anti-war stance was clear, there is little in mass that ties it explicitly to the Vietnam era. This was an event piece that was composed for the opening of the new Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., with no future planned, and thus practicality wasn't a consideration, so it's not been revived a whole lot since, save for the Bernstein centennial celebrations from a few years ago. The 1970s were a time of great personal disarray for Bernstein. He had had many gay flings over the years of his marriage to Felicia, and in the run-up to Mass, he met a man named Tom Cothran, 
who proofread the piano vocal score of Mass and was accepted as a close family friend. Cawthron would not be the only one, however. At one point, Bernstein and his daughter Jamie once had crushes on the same guy, and health problems continued to plague both Leonard and Felicia, which was brought on by a diet of overwork and incessant smoking. His next theater piece was 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and this was a disaster of epic proportions. It was a confusingly set up musical. It was a musical about a play rehearsal play and people within had a play the characters within another and rehearsal. Plays and it, you know, it was just a mess. I don't think there was a single good review of this thing. It has never been published in any form. It was never even recorded. Like Usually even flops have cast recordings on Broadway. This didn't even have that. It drove a wedge between him and his collaborators and even his wife. For a man so used to success tumbling down to earth like this must have been even harder on him than it would be on an average person who wasn't so doomed to success. Leonard and Felicia had grown apart, especially since her mastectomy for breast cancer, and his same-sex trysts got less and less discreet. Felicia gave him an ultimatum about his relationship to Tom Cawthron, which led to Bernstein moving out. Friends had seen this coming for quite some time. Many of them saw their relationship at that point as being based on friendship and nothing deeper. It wasn't all bad. In this period, Bernstein landed the prestigious Charles Eliot Norton professorship at Harvard, which was a year-long residency. His time at Harvard coincided with his daughter Jamie's junior year there, and she felt like he was kind of squishing in on her social life. As part of this position, he was tasked with giving six lectures, known as the Norton Lectures every Norton professor gives them, and his were titled The Unanswered Question after the Charles Ives piece. You can find them floating around on YouTube in whole or in part. They keep going up and going down over the years. But basically, the big takeaways from these lectures are these two points. One, Bernstein argued that music could be considered in linguistic terms, and every facet and every detail of that analogy he wrung out until it was not ring outable anymore. I'm not sure that's a word. Anyway, the second point was that tonality, the system of tonal hierarchy that gave us harmony, was actually, for Bernstein, kind of a natural law of the universe because it arises out of how the overtone series works. He felt like other systems of the avant-garde, like the 12-tone system, were artificial and superficial and you would always have some kind of tonal hierarchy. That was the meaning that music imparted to human beings. The takeaway was that the 20th century was full of so much harmonic ambiguity that this system broke down. And after the system broke down, where was music going to go? Bernstein pursued eclecticism in his music to the point that Igor Stravinsky once apparently called him a musical department store. Unusual meters were the hallmark of Bernstein's music, and it affected what he liked in others' music as well. This included the large time signatures of the Chichester Psalms to the cross rhythms of America from West Side Story. He had a particular affinity for 7-4 time, and musical ciphers in the same way that Robert Schumann would use them often crop up in his pieces, particularly little incidental ones. And his stance against wild modernism stood him well in the long run as a generation of musicians who felt alienated from the avant-garde looked to Bernstein in his later years as an icon of someone who was able to do something that was fresh and exciting and inventive while still being a fundamentally tonal composer. Nevertheless, one piece of his, which is still unpublished, is a computer-generated composition. It's called Five Against Two, and if you're ever at the Library of Congress, you should check it out. Bernstein's main problem with the avant-garde was that he felt that composers who used those systems did not use them in the service of actually eliciting an emotional response from the listeners. He was politically calculated in his supposed neutrality towards atonality, but there's a more complicated story with his relationship to it. You see, Copeland and Stravinsky were two composers who were often cited as not having lost their sound, whatever their sound was, when they adopted the 12-tone technique towards 
the end of both of their careers. Bernstein said that his 1964 sabbatical was an attempt to do just that, and he said that he had more fragments of attempts at writing a 12-tone piece than he had pieces. And it sort of leads me to wonder if maybe, perhaps, there's a chance that he felt inferior to these other composers because they figured out a way to include this system in their music and still have it sound like them and still make it emotionally powerful and effective. How couldn't he? Ultimately, he just decided that it wasn't his music to write, which is fine, but I am wondering if he compared himself to others in this regard. More than anything, the presence of non-traditionally tonal music in his output points to the fact that in his lectures, he sacrificed nuance to the altar of entertainment. He simplified things, but the truth is that he did dabble in these systems. It just didn't work out for him that often. Mostly, his interest in music was a question of form. For him, Beethoven was the greatest composer because he had a great command of form, not because he was particularly strong melodically or harmonically or orchestrationally. Bernstein cast his own music in ways that mix up forms. West Side Story has elements of an opera to it. He extracted a symphonic suite of dances from it. The Mass is a theater piece for a bunch of performers, but it's not a musical. And his third symphony has a narrator in it. Like, there's a bunch of ways in which he's always trying to throw a wrinkle into something that's already established. He used large intervals in ways that were expressive and song-like, and he was known for recycling music between pieces. Eventually, in part because Bernstein tried living with Tom Cothran only for them to get fed up, at how different each other was in a cohabitating environment, Leonard and Felicia reconciled, only for Felicia to be diagnosed with lung cancer. Not wanting the press to focus in on his wife's diagnosis, Leonard kept up appearances by continuing his regularly demanding schedule of orchestral appearances and guest concerts all around the world. When she died, Bernstein blamed himself for his wife's death and I think that this allowed him the mental wiggle room to continue to keep smoking because by blaming himself and not his wife's 30 years of smoking, he could feel responsible and he could still smoke. He tried to quit whenever she was on her deathbed. He did go to smoking cessation therapy, but it just didn't work. He was too much of a hard partier and he continued this very intense and stressful life literally stressful on his body for the rest of his life. His lifestyle was one where, despite having just turned 60, he felt far older. He could feel himself aging and he was focused on his own death. He felt like it was closer to him than he could possibly imagine. Turns out he was right, but he didn't know that he had time for one last crack at one big project, so in 1980 he cleared the decks and he wanted to focus on writing something that was important to him. This ended up being A Quiet Place, an opera that was a sequel to his earlier trouble in Tahiti, and one that can only be understood properly in the context of Felicia's death. While met with mixed responses, Bernstein was genuinely happy with what he had accomplished. While not a catharsis per se, it was at least the culmination of his desire to write a truly American opera. It was clear that Felicia had been an impulse control on him. And now, with her out of the picture, he was mixing alcohol and prescription drugs in dangerous, personality-altering ways. He also, with her out of the picture, was able to embark on a series of openly gay relationships, which was quite a bold move to do in the early era of the AIDS pandemic, when knowledge of the fledgling disease was low, and gay men were often targeted. His self-destructive smoking habit was best summed up in a quote from 1986. He said that he'd beaten the odds by having been diagnosed with emphysema when he was in his 20s, and the doctors kept saying that he would be dead by 35 and 45 and 55, and he said that he was still alive and kicking, so why should he care? Why should he give up smoking then? As he got older, the jet-setting life took a greater toll on his health, and he still had great conducting accomplishments. One of his last big conducting roles was when the Berlin Wall fell down. He conducted an orchestra in the Ode to Joy from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, except instead of the word joy, Freude, in the final movement's choral setting of the Schiller poem, he replaced that with the word Freiheit, freedom. It was an ode to freedom instead of an ode to joy. A little kitschy, but uh, people were excited about the fall of communism. People were excited about the reunification of Germany, and there was a lot of reason to celebrate 
this freedom being brought to the East German people. His health was on the brink. A stabbing pain in his lung, he felt, was a sure sign of cancer. That was what Felicia had complained of way back when she was initially diagnosed. Doctors suspected mesothelioma, a type of cancer usually associated with exposure to asbestos and not smoking. Regardless of whether or not it was, radiation worked, and that unfortunately led to a buildup of fluid around his lungs. When they treated the fluid around his lungs, he had a huge skin breakout, and from then it was just a series of increasing health problems. Mostly, he just couldn't breathe. It was the emphysema, and for the pain, he took a dozen times more Valium than he was prescribed. He died in October 1990, at the age of 72. In some ways, although Bernstein was a giant of music in every facet, his life is a story of the dangers of excess and the risks you run if you try to do everything. He required constant variety and was in his element when surrounded by as much as possible. His father reported that he just couldn't ever bring himself to say no to anyone. At the height of fame, Bernstein employed a veritable team of experts to keep him in as good a shape as possible. He had all sorts of particular medical specialists, including a psychiatrist, and someone whose job it was to yank the hair so hard that his skin popped away from his skull, which was supposed to be a preventative treatment for balding. Her name was Rita, but they called her the Popper. Bernstein once compared composition to a religious experience, and he genuinely loved to compose but found it increasingly difficult to do throughout his life. He would have written more, but there came a point where the stress was just too much for him to compose, once telling composer Richard Daniel Poor that he had 20 really great four-bar phrases, but that he couldn't do anything with any of them. Daniel Poor tried to advise his older colleague to relax and let himself be creative, to which Bernstein replied, Do you have any idea what it's like to be Leonard Bernstein? That's just a look into the immense pressure Bernstein felt to be, well, everything that he and his public had built him up to be. Anything short of perfection wasn't good enough. He had an addictive personality who had to have the public love him no matter what, and while that fed into his great charisma on the podium, it was bad for his health. The greatest regret of his life, he said, was that he hadn't composed more. It was here at Brandeis in 1953 that Bernstein opined on the nature of art as he was wont to do. He said that man's capacity for laughter is nobler than his divine gift of suffering. Although he understood the tragedies of the 20th century, there was always hope. There was always a spirit of continuation. A violent world required beautiful, passionate music-making. That was his reply to violence.